Well, I was, I just got back from Maine. Um, uh, Paxville Baptist is going on a mission trip to Maine, and uh, we had to work on some uh, some details. And we also uh, were able just to kind of get away a little bit, and that worked out well. But I was told that the weather was pretty bad Sunday. Um, the church that we were members of, the pastor said that the lightning was going so much that they didn't feel like that they could run the the wireless mic. He said it was the first time they've seen that. So I don't know if it was a way for you guys, but it, um, the weathers have been really uh, challenging. And we can always keep in prayer the folks in California. Um, they seem to be hit hard in Mississippi. I can't imagine that. And, of course, the, sh- the recent shooting in Nashville. Oh, really? So, um, and uh, so, you know, there's, there's times when, especially in a rainstorm, where I just thank the Lord that I have a roof over my head. You know, there's lots of people that may not be able to say that and such. Well, this coming Sunday is uh, Palm Sunday. And, and that's where I kind of want to go at with the, uh, the Bible study this evening as we talk about Palm Sunday. And on, Palm Sun- uh, on Sunday, you've got everybody singing praises to God, but then you fast forward it to Friday and what happens? Everybody's saying, crucify him, crucify him. And we're going to talk about that. How, how could one group, not even a week, sing Jesus' praises? And perhaps even the similar people be condemning Christ uh, to death. So we're going to look at two passages and compare them and then look at what uh, that can uh, uh, say to us. So, but before we do begin, let's, let's pray. Oh, holy God, I thank you. Lord, you are a God that never tires of hearing us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, in spite of me, to share your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If, if this side here would look up Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 35, and this side over here would look up Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 20. This side here, Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse, thir- verse 35. This side, Matthew 27, beginning in verse 20. <clears throat> if it was... Uh, 27. And I would say whoever has it first stand up, but the people with phones would beat you because um, they are um, fast. So um, so let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 35. And let's see if we can get um, someone from this side um, read two verses here. Uh, whatever you normally use. And they brought it to Jesus and pulling their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Okay. Someone else take the, the last verse, just uh, or the uh let's see. Okay, the, the next the uh thirty seven and thirty eight. This is, this is the primary reason that we call it Palm Sunday. Uh, in some translations, or in some, uh, cha- uh, it's in all four gospel accounts, and some it would say that people 
they cut down palms and laid it in front of him. And it was an incredible parade. And people were shouting praises. And, uh, and so it was very, very festive. And, and, and it, was, it was just honoring to the Lord. Okay? And this got the bad side over here. You got the, you got the um, scriptures that kind of um, aren't as festive and good. Uh, somebody uh, read 20 and 21. Of Matthew chapter 27. Okay, and somebody close it out with 22 and 23. It's amazing in the same area you would you would have people shouting praises and literally less than a week people saying put him to death let him die let him die and that's what I'm going to look at uh, as far as what does it look like to have a casual faith or a committed faith and as, and as we contrast these two passages I want to look at a couple keys the first key is that a committed faith is Christ-centered, not self-centered. Take a look at, um, and I'll read it in verse 37 of Luke chapter 19. Take a look, it says, When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God. Now, when you see the word for, it kind of tells you why for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. And then later in verse 38, it says, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. A, a Christ-centered faith, a committed faith, is Christ-centered, not self-centered. And as I think about it, in our day, when you talk to people, it is so much about what can God do for me. It's almost like our world, it says, I want God to be a genie in a bottle. I want to tell him what I want. I want him to give me it and then leave me alone. Or for some, it's kind of, and I, I'm seeing this more with our younger generation. It's a, it's a cafeteria. You know what? I like this about Jesus, but man, I don't think I like this because that, that's kind of harsh. That's talking about sin. But I like this and picking and choosing how you want and what you want to believe in. Or an executive kind of faith that says, all right, Jesus, I'll give you on my calendar, I'll give you 10 to 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and I'm good. But as we read in our passage, the people really, when they, when they were having the parade and when they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, in many cases, they were shouting praises for what Jesus would do for them. They were shouting praises because of his what? What, what do we read? His miracles, the things that he did. And then also in verse 38, it says, blessings on the king, they were anticipating a Messiah that would overthrow Rome. And they would go back to their heyday where they would have uh, autonomy and independence. But then you fast forward it to the time when Pilate brings out Jesus and says, Here's your king who is, had been beaten and bloody. and He didn't look the part anymore. And they said, we don't want him. 
Give us a murderer instead of Jesus. A casual faith is all about me. What can God do for me? And if we're not careful, sometimes we can get mad at God when he doesn't do what we want him to do. Many of you know um, that I think it might have been right before I was getting ready to speak um, uh, last time that we were getting ready to go to court with Ronnie. And it turned out that anything that could have gone wrong went wrong in that court. The judge wouldn't even uh, look at us, wouldn't allow us to speak, wouldn't let our lawyers speak. And in about 10 minutes, the judge says, settled, um, gather up his belongings, and his grandmother will leave with him at 5 o'clock that same day. And I looked, and he was at school, and we picked him up, and I just was in that shock. And, and thinking about, he doesn't have a clue what's about to happen. He doesn't have a clue that I, he may never see me or Penny again. And it was very, very easy to have fallen into the trap of saying, where were you, Lord? This was not right. This was injustice. And the Lord had to remind me that he knows what injustice is. He experienced it himself. And my faith would not be committed if I just said, okay, Lord, I'm done with you for a while. We're going to go on to silent treatment. I just had to trust that God knew what is going ahead and things that I don't know. And so when we look at that, our faith can't be all about me, me, me. A second characteristic of a committed faith that we see as we contrast these passages kind of plays off what I, I just shared about Ronnie is that a committed faith is not hindered trials and crises. Committed faith. Two weeks ago I was heading to, to preach at Shaw Heights Baptist Church. And right before I got to Shaw Heights, I get a text that one of our pastors, Tommy McDonald, his daughter had been killed in a car accident. And to make matters worse, if there is any worse, she was literally one mile from their house. And talking with, with Tommy, it, it wasn't about, I'm done with the Lord. Why did he take my daughter? It was, I trust him, even when it doesn't make sense. At the parade, it was easy to offer praises. Everybody was doing it. Even if, I would imagine, even people that didn't know who Jesus was, they kind of caught, caught up in it. Who doesn't like a parade? In Ohio, it was great because, um, and they don't do this enough now, I guess, because people are afraid they're going to get sued. Um, but they called them the candy parades. And the kids would bring their bags, and they would load them up with all kinds of candy. 
Um, my wife would never go with us to those things because I, I, would, I would teach my kids how to beg, she said. Um, but we always got a lot of candy. I don't know, give them that sad face, you know. <laughs> um, but at the parade, everybody was celebrating. But at the trial, to speak out was risky. Possibly even life-threatening. A lot of times we come to Jesus and we don't expect anything bad to happen. Somebody said once, the safest place you can be is the center of God's will. And that sounds right, but it's not true. Because you all know when we come to faith in Christ and when we choose to want to follow him, we get a big target on our back. Because Satan doesn't like that. And he's going to pull out every single stop. The best place is in the center of God's will. But I've read many a missionary biography where a missionary lost their life. I was reading of, many of you remember um, Elizabeth Elliot and her husband, <clears throat> I think in the 50s, and they were trying to reach the, the Aka Indians of South America. And their husband, and three of the ladies' husbands were murdered by the same people they were trying to, to reach. And instead of saying, God, why me? She stayed. And she was eventually, his wife, Elizabeth, was eventually able to lead to Christ, the man who had killed her husband. A committed faith. And I think we're, I, I think we're entering in a stage in the life of our country. You can see it. That there's, it's, it's not a big leap for for. for us to see that perhaps there may come a time where, where we don't have the same freedoms to worship the Lord and that it may come with a cost. But a committed faith says, Lord, you are God, regardless of what happens. Did anybody remember Corey Ten Boone? In the book, The Hiding Place, it tells of her story. Now, her family wasn't Jewish, but they hid Jewish families and people in their home so they wouldn't get sent to the concentration camp. But in, in due time, they were caught, and they were treated as if they were Jewish. And they were sent to a concentration camp. Her father went to one and Corey and her sister Betsy went to another one. And when they got to Barracks 28, they were horrified by what they saw. There were no mattresses. It was just straw where a mattress would go. And they were putting three women to every single fit or every single space where the straw was. And there above the straw was a swarm of fleas. If you ever dealt with a flea, that's the most annoying thing you ever have to deal with as far as a, 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 a pest. But one day it was Betsy who said, I, I, Corey, I have the solution. And Corey says, okay, tell me. The Bible says, rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's it, Corey. She says, we've got to give thanks to God 
not just in some circumstances, but in all circumstances. So they began to thank the Lord about, one, that they were together, two, that miraculously, even though they were intensively searched going into the concentration camp, they were able to keep their Bibles because there was some concentration of women in the camp, uh, in their, their barracks, these were opportunities to share Jesus. But, but, but Betsy took it a step farther than Corey thought was, was right. She said, Betsy, she said, Corey, now we got to thank God for the fleas. And Corey says, there's no way I'll thank God for these fleas. Betsy reminded Corey, the Bible didn't say give thanks in some circumstances. The Bible said give thanks in all circumstances. So even though Corey knew she was right, she thanked God for the fleas. But later it turned out that Betsy was not wrong. You see, the fleas were a nuisance, but they also were a blessing because the guards didn't want to come into their barracks because they didn't want to be infested with fleas. So that protected the women from abuse. That gave them opportunities to lead Bible studies among the ladies without the guards coming in. Through those fleas, God protected for at least a time those women. Do you have a faith that can thank God even for the fleas? There's times where I, I, I'm a belly aker. I just kind of, when, you know, I can complain and complain until the Lord says, look at everything that you got. It, when we share Jesus with people, it, it, it can't be if you accept Christ, everything in your life is going to be good. Because that's not true. But what is true is that one day in heaven, everything will be made right. There will be no sickness, no pain, no fi finances, no injustice. And if you think about it, this life that we have here on earth is really but a blink compared to forever and ever and ever. Finally, a third key to a committed faith, it's about relationship, not religion. When people say to me, you're a religious man, I say, well, I don't like that term, but I will tell you I have a relationship a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what the difference between a religion and relationship is? The people in that parade, they knew about Jesus, but they didn't know him. I can, if I, if I go into a store and see some of you, I will recognize you. I won't remember your name, but I'll recognize you as somebody I know. But it's not like we have a relationship in the sense that we spend time together and we, uh, we see each other a lot. When I, when I was in Texas, the Lord, he taught me really what the difference between relationship and religion was. I went to the, <clears throat> I was in seminary and I was working in a community that was very, very poor and it was high crime. And I, I was going to church in an area there and I went to the United Way and asked, how can I better serve the Lord in this community. And they said, well, there's this woman 
whose husband just died. And she might need some help. You know, just like uh, young people do. I kind of stiffened up and thought, wow, I'm going to put my seminary to use. Thinking, how will I be able to, I'll be able to pray for this lady. So I knocked on her door and I heard some shuffling. It took a long while. And Bernice came to the door. And Bernice invited me in once I told her who I was. And I was waiting for her to say how I could pray for her. And when I said, how can I help you? She said, I need help with someone picking up my groceries. Well, I will tell you, there's nothing more torturous to me than shopping. Um, I make a really um, conversation with my wife before she goes out. Is this going to be a linger shop or is this going to be a get quick and go shop? Because if it's a get quick, I'll go with you. But if this is a linger and look at everything, then it, that is so boring for me. But I had already asked her how I could help her. So I, I thought, well, how can this can't be that hard? So I got to her house. And she was a couponder. Um, and she got the newspaper. And so she had three different grocery stores circled where she wanted stuff bought. And she had the coupon, coupons with it. And she said, can you do this Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? And I said, I guess. And so I began for a year. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, all my friends were in, in, in church jobs and they were saying, well, I'm the associate pastor, I'm the pastor of this. I wondered if I could get some resume credit for being associate pastor of Bernice um, because I was picking up everything three times a week. Later, she, she started getting stronger and, and our visits grew longer because I would get the groceries and she would have a meal fixed and then she'd have the dominoes out. And so we would play dominoes and I would eat with her and our visits grew longer. There was one time where I, I went to visit her and she wasn't there and the neighbor said, where well, she had fallen and hurt herself. She was had gone to the hospital, and she had fractured uh, her hip, I believe. And she was in the in the emergency room, and she was doing this number. And I was like, man, what's going on with her? And I said, you know, have you lost it? You know, what's going on? And she's like, well, my hip might be broken, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to have a stroke in here. I want to get my blood going. I'm like, whatever. And so she asked me to stay in her house and, um, and kind of guard it, like, you know, what, I, what could I do? Um, and when she came home, I stayed with her for a couple days. And on the second or third night, as we were talking, 77-year-old Bernice accepted Jesus Christ. And our relationship kind of changed at that point. I... You know, she got stronger, and we began to, um, you know, to have uh, even a closer uh, friendship. Tells you how popular I was. I graduated from um, seminary, and Bernice hosted my party. And I'm like, uh, uh, that tells a lot about how um, um, in the popular crowd I was. But in the summer, summer after graduation, I was staying at... Bernice's house till I could figure out what I was going to do. And she came into my room one evening and she said, I'm having some chest pains. The doctor says to take nitroglycerin. And I've taken two, but they're still here. Can you sit with me? And I said, sure. And so when five minutes was up, I gave her another nitroglycerin and I got a wet cloth and put it on her head and and held her hand and as they gave her fourth and the fifth one and and at the fifth one she says they say once you've given the fifth to 
to um, call 911. And so I, I called 911, and they took her to the hospital. And I was notified rather quickly that she had passed away going to the hospital. And I thought, Lord, is that how much you love us? That you took young whippersnapper, whatever, Kevin, seminary student, to spend two years building a relationship with a 70-plus-year-old lady just so she could be in heaven. Guys, that's the difference between religion and relationship. If I drove, by, I could drive by Bernice's house. That's religion. But if I took the time every day or every other day to buy her groceries and to eat and stay and laugh and play dominoes where she would cheat, that's relationship. And guys, that's what our world is craving more of than ever before. Somehow along the line, we got into this thing of, of numbers. But you know, in God's economy, even if it takes two years to do something you don't like to do, to build a relationship so that one who wasn't going to heaven can go to heaven. That makes it all worthwhile. And so as you head into Easter, spend some time with the Lord and think about, is my faith casual or is it committed? Is it all about me? Do I expect everything to always go right? Is it more about religion or is it more about my Jesus? My um, <clears throat> aunt passed away this week and we came back a little bit early from our, our trip to Maine. And I'm doing the service on Saturday and reading her notes. She says, I want everybody to know how much I love my Jesus. Guys, that's about relationship. And hopefully, the more we love Jesus, the more others will want to know why. Would you pray with me, Jesus? Thank you for this opportunity. And may this Easter we not lose sight of the reason for it all. And may we cling to you, Jesus, not for what we know about you, but how you walk with us and guide us through every aspect, good and bad, of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.